All right. Today we're going to continue our study of Unit 9 with Lesson 4, which is homeostasis. Here's our warm-up. Both the esophagus and the small intestine are involved in the digestion of food. The esophagus squeezes food into the stomach by wave-like muscle contractions. Peptidase enzymes in the small intestine break food molecules into smaller molecules. Which statement best describes changes to food, changes to food during digestion? And you're going to type your answer in the Zoom chat box, then I'll pause for you to read over the answers and get your answer in. If you chose A, the muscle contractions result in physical changes while the action of the Peptidase results in chemical changes, you would be correct. Our lesson goals today, you should be able to describe and relate responses in organisms that may result from internal stimuli, such as wilting in plants and fever or vomiting in animals that allow them to maintain balance. And our essential question, what allows organisms to maintain internal balance, which is also called homeostasis? There's our standards. Vocabulary words, homeostasis, monitor, coordinating center, regulator, communication center, target, negative feedback loop, stomata, guard cells, and positive feedback loop. And we're going to start out with an amoeba. Sorry about that. Did you know just sitting here right now, you're doing something absolutely remarkable? Well, you, your cells, tissues, organs, organ systems, yes, we just leveled up those biological levels of organization, they're all working towards something called homeostasis. It's a state of balance. Yes, homeostasis means many things in your body. For example, that your blood stays within a certain pH level range. It means that your blood glucose remains within a certain range. It means your internal body temperature stays within a certain range. See, we've mentioned the major body systems before and that they work together. And today we're going to talk about how they work together using something called positive and negative feedback. And also how this relates to homeostasis. So many years ago, I had a pet bearded dragon. Her name was Debbie and she was the best lizard ever. Debbie used to sit on our couch with me when I'd watch TV, and she loved to have her chin scratched. I even got her a bearded dragon leash so I could take her outside. Yeah, they make those. Anyway, Debbie loved her heat lamp. She would sit under the heat lamp on her rock, and when she got too hot, she would get off her rock and out of the heat lamp range and go somewhere else. She had a huge enclosure, too, because I wanted Debbie to be a happy lizard so she could find an ideal temperature. Why all this talk about Debbie? Well, Debbie is an example of an animal that some people refer to as cold-blooded, or a fancier term, ectotherm. We actually like the fancier term a bit better, though, because her blood isn't necessarily cold. Her body temperature can fluctuate with the environment. But not you. You are warm-blooded, or the fancier term, an endotherm. Your body works hard to keep the internal temperature it keeps, it's also a beautiful example of something called negative feedback. Before we define it, let us show you this example. Say you're in an environment that is very hot, like being outside in the Texas summer heat. That's typically hot. Thanks to nerves, which can act as sensors, the brain notices this. It will send signals to counteract this variable. Sweat glands do what they do best, sweat. Heat is lost as that sweat evaporates off your skin. You may have some redness too, that's because your blood vessels are getting wider, dilating, in order to help get rid of that heat. And the result, whether you realize it or not, helps you lower your body temperature. But wait, what if you go inside now and the AC is blasting? You'll stop sweating, you may even shiver. The muscle contractions of shivering can generate heat. And those blood vessels will now decrease in diameter size, constrict, to help you conserve the heat because that makes it harder for the heat to escape. Your body temperature can increase then. This is negative feedback. So a simplified definition, negative feedback is when some variable triggers a counteracting response in order to come back to some set point. If we consider that this whole thing is actually a negative feedback loop, 
we can see that the negative feedback brings the body back to the set point, which in this case is a stable temperature, keeping homeostasis. Negative feedback is also going on in the regulation of your glucose, your blood sugar. Okay, we're really simplifying this here, as we often do. But when glucose, blood sugar, is too high, one hormone that is released is insulin. I always imagine insulin as this hormone that makes the cells say, feed me, because it has the ability to make cells take in glucose. On the flip side, if glucose is too low in the blood, a hormone called glucagon can be released. This hormone can have many effects, and one of them is that it can cause the liver to release glucose into the blood. There's more to the regulation of blood sugar than this, but you can see how this is negative feedback. You have counteracting responses here in order to keep homeostasis. So what about positive feedback? Positive feedback is when instead of getting a counteracting response to some variable, you instead intensify the variable. Positive feedback can be like more, more, more instead of let's counteract this. The example that always stuck with me when I was a student is the example about the human baby being born. In biology classrooms everywhere, it's a classic example. When a human baby is ready to be born, there is pressure on the cervix, and that pressure and the hormones involved cause contractions of the uterus, because that's a big part about how the baby is going to be born. More release of hormones will equal more contractions and pressure, which will cause more release of hormones more release of hormones will mean more contractions and pressure. Contractions help get the baby out, but it's also a part of a beautiful illustration of what positive feedback can do. So why do we care about feedback? Other than, you know, the importance of negative feedback in maintaining homeostasis and the role of positive feedback in many body processes. Well, we also need to understand feedback so we can understand what is happening when there is a problem in the feedback systems. One example, perhaps you've heard of type 1 diabetes. It's a disorder that can mean that your pancreas, which is an organ that is involved with making some hormones like insulin, is not working correctly. Insulin is not produced, and because of that, one issue is that you're not going to be able to get glucose, the blood sugar, into your cells. Now, glucose outside of the cells cannot be used in cellular respiration. The cells need to take the glucose in to make ATP energy in cellular respiration. Therefore, your cells need to be able to take in the glucose to survive. So many type 1 diabetics need to give themselves insulin and monitor their blood sugar because the negative feedback may not work as it should. Well, that's it for the Amoeba Sisters, and we remind you to stay curious. All right, so let's jump into homeostasis a little bit more here. So homeostasis is the regulation and maintenance of the internal environment of an organism so the organism stays in safe ranges. It is often referred to as dynamic equilibrium, which is a mechanism to ensure that all body systems function within an acceptable range to sustain life. For instance, humans have a normal temperature of about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. If your body temperature goes above normal temperature, then you are likely suffering from an infection and your body had to raise its temperature to fight off the infection. So homeostasis is the body's attempt to maintain normal levels within your body. There are three components to the control system for homeostasis. Monitor, coordinating center, and regulator. So the monitor, this detects the change from normal range. The coordinating center, it determines what changes need to be made. And the regulator, this restores balance. Okay, so the monitors, they're the sensors. They gather the data. The control center receives the data and sends messages. Communicate communication system delivers the messages to target organs and tissues and the targets respond to change. So this is just showing you get goosebumps. That's a form of homeostasis. A negative feedback loop is a type of self-regulating system in which increased output from the system inhibits future production by the system and it's necessary for homeostasis. The feedback compares current conditions to set ranges. So basically a negative feedback loop 
stops the change. An example would be heat stress. Okay, so monitor, you've got the thermoceptors or thermoreceptors. The coordinating center would be the hypothalamus. The regulator would be the skin blood vessels that dilate and the sweat glands initiate sweating. And the result would be the body temperature decreases and the hypothalamus turns off. Another negative feedback loop example would be cold stress. The monitor, again, the thermoreceptor. The coordinating center, again, is the hypothalamus. The regulator, the skin blood vessels, this time they constrict and skeletal muscles contract. And the result of this is that the body temperature increases and the hypothalamus turns off. Okay, the example that they showed you for the positive feedback loop would be um, a woman going into labor to have the baby. Okay, so. And then here are your examples of the negative feedback loop. Quick learning check. If the environment gets cold, we will often shiver too. Type your answer in the Zoom chat and I'll pause for you to do so. We often shiver to increase our body temperature. Okay, so we've talked about homeostasis in humans. Let's talk about homeostasis in plants. This is the control of water levels in the plant and it's important to the survival of the plant and is achieved by a number of methods. Uh, by the waxy cuticle on the leaves, the storage of water, and the opening and closing of stomata. An example of negative feedback loop, um, the plant stomata, here's our example. The stomata, we know are leaf openings on the plant leaves. We know the stomata have guard cells surrounding them that open and close the stomata. And stomata allows gas exchange for photosynthesis. So the opening and closing of the stomata maintains water balance in the plant, and this maintains the homeostasis. The plants are changing the stomata to keep water levels normal. Thus, it is a negative feedback loop. Positive feedback loop in plants are rare. They enhance or amplify changes, and they tend to move a system away from homeostasis and make it more unstable. Changes are detected by the organism and increase rather than return to normal. So remember the example we gave with humans would be a lady going into labor to have a baby. So in summary, what allows organisms to maintain internal balance or homeostasis? Well, there are three components to the control system. It's monitor that detects the change from normal range. The coordinating center determines what changes need to be made. And the regulator, this restores balance. The sensors gather the data. The control center receives the data, sends messages, and then the communication system delivers messages to target organs, tissues, and targets respond to change. Homeostasis is managed by negative feedback loops, which is a type of self-regulating system in which uh, increased output from the system inhibits future production by the system or the positive feedback loop that we talked about with the baby. And here's a short video. Fifty feet away from you is the base of the tallest mountain in the world, Mount Everest. Although you have dreamed of climbing this mountain for years, trekking up it will be mentally and physically taxing. Along the way, you will face numerous challenges, like a reduction in oxygen, grueling cold temperatures, and vertical inclines close to 90 degrees. Every organism, including the mountain climber, must maintain a certain internal environment when external conditions are fluctuating. Homeostasis is an organism's ability to maintain these internal conditions despite external changes. Body temperature is one of the most common internal conditions an organism must maintain.
The body temperature of a human is set at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Its internal temperature must remain around 98.6 degrees. Thermal regulation is the way an organism maintains this set temperature. We can define two types of organisms based on the way they control body temperature. Endotherms, such as birds and mammals, rely mostly on metabolism to maintain their temperature. An eagle, soaring high in the sky, can keep its internal temperature relatively constant without any help. But ectotherms, such as frogs and snakes, rely on environmental sources to regulate internal temperature. For example, when the sun is beating down upon a frog, it might hop under a tree. Amphibians, several species of fish, and other invertebrates are also considered ectotherms because of their internal temperature fluctuations. Besides temperature regulation, organisms are tasked with the regulation of blood glucose levels. When you haven't eaten in a while, your glucose level will be very low. To combat this and maintain homeostasis, the pancreas releases glucagon, which stimulates the formation of glucose. These new glucose molecules are used to increase blood sugar levels. On the other hand, if too much glucose is present in the blood, the pancreas secretes insulin to remove the sugar. Diabetes is a condition that results when the body cannot maintain its blood glucose levels. Traveling back to Mount Everest, we feel the icy cold air hitting our skin like needles. To detect freezing temperatures, a mammal uses receptors in the hypothalamus as temperature sensors. A sensor detects the stimuli, other parts of the organism react, and ideally this causes our bodies to reestablish a set point. One response the climber might have to extreme Arctic temperatures on Mount Everest is the reduction of blood flow to parts of the body not holding an essential organ, like fingers and toes. Now, let's explore different mechanisms of maintaining homeostasis using feedback loops. Simply stated, a negative feedback loop reduces the stimulus and a positive feedback loop amplifies the stimulus. The reduction of blood flow to certain areas of the body, in our last example, is a negative feedback loop. By reducing the blood flow to non-essential organs, the body retains heat and thus reduces the cold stimulus. Most biological mechanisms of feedback are negative, but think of blood clotting as an example of positive feedback. When a blood vessel is damaged, platelets adhere at the site of injury. After adhesion, these platelets release chemicals that attract more platelets and enable the formation of a blood clot. We have learned that homeostasis is the ability of an organism to maintain internal conditions despite environmental changes. Organisms use positive and negative feedback loops and other internal systems to maintain homeostasis every day. Even though most of us will never reach Everest, we have reached the peak of knowledge on homeostasis. All right. So for our exit ticket, which of the following describes homeostasis? I'll pause for you to answer in Zoom chat. If you chose D, organism's ability to maintain stable internal conditions, you are correct. All right, so this is the end of lesson 9.4, and I'll tell you what we're doing next.